graduation. This is a big deal. Major milestone in life, right? Uh, something that you take note of. Something to figure out, you know, what have I accomplished so far? What are my dreams for the future? But I want you to know right now, it doesn't matter what age you are. I mean, some of you guys, they call children. Some of you, they call teenagers. Some of you, young adults. But age does not matter. You know why? Because age is not a limiting factor when it comes to accomplishing mighty feats. Age is not a limiting factor. Anybody ever hear of Bill Gates? Founder of Microsoft? At the age of 13, he wrote his first computer program. At 17, he formed a company called Drafto Data, which analyzed traffic data. Or how about anybody heard of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart? Mozart was composing music by the age of five, performing in front of royalty, kings and queens, by the age of six. By his teenage years, he had already written several symphonies and operas. And he established himself as one of the greatest composers in history. The Bible also tells us of many heroes who accomplished great things at a very young age. Josiah became king of Judah at the age of eight. He led religious reform, restoring the worship to the true God, purging the kingdom of idolatry. God called Samuel when he was still a boy to be a prophet and a judge for Israel. Samuel was the major influence in the first two kings of Saul and David. And David, David the one whom God said, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. David accomplished mighty feats at a very young age. And that's who we're going to talk about today, David. David got us started at a very young age. The Lord had sent Samuel to anoint one of his, the sons of Jesse to be the next king of Israel. And when Samuel arrived, Jesse brought all his sons, was praying all of his sons in front of Samuel. And Samuel, just listening to God, is like, not this one, not this one, not this one. And, and let's pick this story up here. Bring up 1 Samuel 16, 10 to 13, please. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. His father didn't even invite him to the dinner. The youngest. And there he is. He's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him here, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and he brought him in. Now he was yet ruddy, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that, young, from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now the Bible doesn't tell us what age he was when he got anointed. Josephus, famous historian, says that David was 10. Most modern commentators are of the opinion that he was 15, but regardless, we know he was very young. Yet, in spite of being anointed king, David ends up going back to his normal routine, pretty much a life of obscurity, until he has a promotion day. You know what David's promotion day was? Nobody knows. What was David's first big thing? Goliath, his promotion day. Now, once again, the Bible doesn't tell us how old he was when he fought Goliath. However, we know that he wasn't old enough to go to the battle. He wasn't old enough to fight. We bring up 1 Samuel 17, 20. The battle is going on, and this is what it says. So David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the things and went as Jesse commanded him. And he came to the camp of the army and was going to fight and the shouting for the battle. So we know that he was young. How do I know that? Because bring up numbers one, two, and three. Take a census of the congregation of the children of Israel by their families, by their fathers, houses, according to the number of names, every male individually, from 20 years old and those above who were able to go to war. So he's got to be younger than 20 years old because he wasn't allowed to go to the war yet. So he's at, at the top age of 19, tops. So he is still just a kid. And now what I want to point out, not only was David young, but nobody believed in David. Nobody really thought David was capable of doing anything great. We saw this first, right, when, 
when David's father didn't even invite him to the dinner with the prophet. He was thought so little of by his own father that he didn't even bring him. Jesse totally excluded him. And now when the war with the Philistines is happening, David's keeping his father's sheep. And then to add insult to injury, Jesse's going to have him take a picnic basket to go see his brothers. I mean, bring up 1 Samuel 17, 17, and 18. Then David said, then Jesse said to his son David, take now for your brothers an ephod of this dried grain and ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry the ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand and see how your brothers fare and bring them back news of them. So his father's like, not only are you not off to fight, but I want you to take a picnic lunch and run down and see how your brothers are doing. Sounds kind of insulting to me. And when David arrives, look how his brothers greet him. 1 Samuel 17, 28. Now Eliab, the oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Few sheep in the wilderness. He doesn't even give David credit for a good-sized flock. Who would you leave all this little bit of sheep with, David? I know your pride and insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see this battle. David's brothers looking down on him. And then Saul talks down on him, 1 Samuel 17, 33. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for you're a youth. What are you doing? You're too young. You're just a kid. You can't fight him. What's the matter with you? Go back home. You were right here with a picnic basket of lunch. Who do you think you are? You're too young. And we add insult to injury, Saul even forgot who David was because Saul had become tormented by demons and David had been going to Saul because when he played his instruments, David, uh, Saul would calm down. Bring up 1 Samuel 16, 22 and 23. Then Saul said to Jesse, please let David stand before me. He has found favor in my sight. And so it was whenever the spirit of God was upon Saul and David would take a harp and play it for him. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and a distressing period would depart him. So now, David's been going, this is before the battle with Goliath, he's been going in front of Saul all the time. He plays his instrument, calms him down, comes here, shows up, kills Goliath, and Saul doesn't even know who he is. Bring up 1 Samuel 17, 57 and 58. Then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that's Goliath, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said, whose son are you, young man? This is how he was so looked down on. Nobody thought he could do anything good. Nobody remembered when he did anything. Talk about being overlooked. Overlooked by family, by friends, from people he served. And, but that doesn't prevent David from doing great things. Now, let's look at this bite. We're going to do a quick skit here. I've got Brother Brian. Where are you? Brother Brian's going to be my Goliath. Give Goliath a hand clap of praise here. Said David was a good-looking kid, so I got Joey here. Joey's going to be my David, so Joey, come on up here. Now, I want you to notice that David is going to do this mighty act, this mighty feat, but he's not going to do it like everybody else told him he had to do it. Saul wants David to fight Goliath like he would. Bring up 1 Samuel 17, 38, and 39. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail, and David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. So they try to tell David, okay, first of all, we think you're too young to do anything, but if you're going to do this, you've got to do it like the way we've always done it. You've got to put on this, this coat of mail. Take off your jacket. He tries that with his jacket, right? He says, I can't use the Saul's Saul, Saul armor. Won't, I can't take the sword and the spear and the shield. He's going to use what God had taught him to use. David says, the Bible says he took a shepherd's staff and a sling. 
And then it says David chose five smooth stones from the river brook. Now what I have here, these are actually river stones, smooth river stones, real river stones, because they didn't have 2024 painted on them back then. <laughs> so David is going to kill Goliath. Now he goes with a sling, right? And I didn't have a real sling, but basically, you know, the sling, they put the stone in a, in a sling and they swing it, swing it, whoo, boom, hit him, right? So we're going to do. I need you to swing this and swing it, and then you need to hit Brother Brian right between the eyes with the stone. So, do that. All right, let's take the stone away. We, some people are laughing. I'm afraid that you might miss. All right, so swing it. You got to go down. Boom, he hit you in the head. Go down, all the way down. All the way down. He's down. Don't go anywhere yet. But Goliath is not dead. It says that the stone knocked him out. So David goes over and takes Goliath's sword and cuts off his head. Now, I did not bring a real sword because I did not think that Brian was going to let that. So pretend that you get a sword to kill him. Now, wait a minute. Wait, wait. This is Goliath's sword. Come here. This is big Goliath. You can't get you know, Look at me. Yeah, it's a big sword. I got it. It's a big sword. There we go. All right. Congratulations. Killed our giant. You guys can go. Thank you very much. Not you. you you're going to get picked clean by the birds and the, the feast of the air. Go ahead. You can go. With God and a young and a stone, young David accomplished what the entire army of Israel could not do. Today, you're about to graduate to a new chapter in your life. You have some choices. Are you going to step into this new phase of your life and face challenges like David and be different? Or are you going to cower like everybody else was doing that day and hide? And don't be misled. When you become a Christian, you're in a battle. Satan's not happy. The world's not happy. Sometimes family members aren't happy. And they want to take away what you have. So what are you going to do? Are you going to fight or are you going to hide? Number two, assuming that you choose to fight, how are you going to fight? Are you going to go forward with the talents and things that God has given you or are you going to try to do it like everybody else? Bring up 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 6. Because, see, we don't fight battles as Christians like everybody else does. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into thought, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We don't fight like everybody else. We don't fight by shooting people or hitting them with a club, or throwing rocks at them. We don't, we don't curse at them. We, we fight different as Christians. Here's how we fight. We get on our knees. We pray about it. You want to be a real man and woman of God? Then don't fight back like the world teaches us. Jesus got insulted and kicked and spit on, and he didn't respond. Not responding when somebody does that to you. Now that, that takes courage. That takes a strength of character. And David did this at a young age. And so I, the question is, what giftings has God given you to develop? Don't try to be like everybody else. Reach over and touch your neighbor and say, I'm not you. Don't try to be like everybody else. David was David, 
He didn't fight it like Saul said he had to fight it. He didn't fight it like the warriors told him how to do it. He was himself. You need to learn right now at this age, be yourself. God made you to be who you are. God made you unique. You are perfectly built. You are a presence. You are a blessing in God's eyes. Be yourself. And the third thing, are you going to take credit for your accomplishments or give God the credit and victories and stay humble? David always gave credit to God. David didn't take that sword and put it up in his room. You know, he didn't take that big sword and, you know, he wasn't picking the sword up and then going, oh, Sophie, Sophie, and sending it off to everybody. He wasn't calling over all the good-looking girls saying, hey, come to my house. See that sword? I killed him. It was his. I took it away from him, cut his head off. He didn't do that. How do I know that he gave credit to God? Bring up 1 Samuel 21, 8 and 9. David is fleeing for his life now. Years later, he's fleeing from Saul, who's trying to kill him. He doesn't have any weapons with him. And, here, and he goes to the priest's house. And David said to Himelech, Is there not here on hand a spear or a sword? I have brought neither my sword nor my weapon with me, because the king's business required haste. So the priest said, The sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, there it is, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. It's in the house of God. It wasn't hanging up on his mantle. If you take that, take it, for there's no other except that one here. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. And you need to understand, this was a milestone decision. When David made that decision about not taking credit for that great victory with Goliath, this wasn't a one-time thing. David did this his entire life. From this point on, God... David gives all of his credit to God for his victories. How do I know that? Because many, many years later, there's no swords, there's no spears, there's no shields in Israel. They've been under captivity and under bad rulers, and they're trying to, trying to do something. And bring up 2 Chronicles 23, 9. And Jehoiada the priest gave to the captains hundreds of the spears and large and small shields, shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of God. David kept putting the victories in God's house. And when you give God credit for the victory, he will come back and give you what you need later on for life. And not just you, it is going to be there for your children's children. So you need to make a decision right now, as young as you are, to give glory to God for your victories. But let me tell you a secret. you got to give him your failures too. You're going to make mistakes. David made lots of mistakes. My, well, the one th good thing my father taught me was, if you're not making mistakes, that means you're not making any decisions. When you make a mistake, fess up, try to make it right, and move on. Give it to God. Give him your victories. Give him your defeats. Life goes much easier if you do that. So I want to close with this. I want to point out, I want to point, first I want to point out that you're different than David. David didn't have people that supported him. You guys are different. You got parents to support you. You got teachers. You got those two pastors over there. You got me. I want to show you something. See the, see the stone here? You guys probably can't see it. The stone, it used to have the word first painted on one side and a flower on the other. Uh, this, I've had this for over 30 years, and I got it when I was starting to, to search for God, and, and somebody had preached on John 8, 7, where Jesus said, let any one of you who is without sin be the first one to cast the stone. And I used to carry it in my pocket to remind myself I'd never be worry, worthy to throw a stone. And now I wore so much, so everything's worn off of it. So today, I got you a stone as a reminder. These are the smooth river stones. David chose that day to fight Goliath. And, and I put the year on it to remind you of the year. So I want, I want all the, the children, everybody who's in, teachers, bring up your kids and come up here and get a stone. Everybody up through you know, children's ministry, the crew, through Nexus, all of you, and then stay up here with your stone because we're going to close in prayer. So come on, take any stone you want. Crew, you can come get stones.
but don't knock over any little kids getting any. And then stay up here after you get your stone. Got a stone? All my crew age folks got stones. And you don't have to have just graduated. If you're in children's ministry, you're in a crew, you're in Nexus, come get a stone. I got a bunch of them up here. And then back up, stay up here, back up a little bit and face me with your stone. Everybody get a stone. Thank you, crew guys, for waiting and for the younger people to get them. I appreciate that. Okay, move out a little bit so the other people can get a stone. Just back up to where Sister Abby is. Back up. You guys all get stones? Get your stones, move out a little bit, and turn around and face me. To the center. We get flags. Did you get your stone? Got a stone? Okay. So I want the, I want the, the pastors to come up and get behind them. I want the teachers to come. I want the parents to come up and get behind these people, behind these children, behind these young people. And we're going to pray. And after we get the pastors and the teachers and the parents, then I'm going to invite the rest of the congregation to come up. Come well, on, we're going to pray for these people. Everybody got a stone? Okay, look at me. So, when you have, every time you look at this stone, in the days, the months, the years to come, I want you to remember two things. Number one, with God, nothing is impossible. There is no giant that could come into your path that you cannot defeat with the help of God. That's number one, right? So just look at this stone and you're like, it doesn't matter what it is. With God, I can have victory on this. And number two, this is where you're not like David. Whatever you do, whatever you fail to do, whatever you accomplish, whatever you fail to accomplish, you have people that, that are behind you. And I can't make promises for all these people, but I'll make a promise for me. You guys paying attention? I promise you, no matter what you do, what you don't do, what you accomplish or don't accomplish, I promise that I will always love you and I will always believe in you. And you've got all these other people here like I said, I can't promise for them, but if I had a guess, I think they'd say the same thing. So you guys are not alone. You're not like David. you got people that believe in you. Okay, so I'm going to come down there, and we're just going to start praying. If you guys want to play music, that's fine. But uh, we're just, I'm going to start praying in the mic, and then I'm just gonna, we're just going to pray for these people. Okay? For these people. All right. Father, I love you, Lord, and I thank you, Lord, for all these children, Lord, and our young people and our teenagers, Lord. Lord, I plead a covering over each and every one of them, God. I pray, Lord, that your hand, Lord, and your anointing would be upon them, Lord, that you would put a hedge of protection, Lord, around our children, Lord. Lord, I, I bind every, every doubt that they have, Lord, every insecurity, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. I bind it, Lord, and I remove it in the name of Jesus. Lord, let them realize, Lord, that with you all things are possible, God, that they can do anything that they set their minds to do, God. That, Lord, you are you are supreme, oh God, and, Lord, that you have your hand upon each and every one of them, God. Lord, and that no matter what, Lord, that they have you on their side, Lord, and they have the people of Abundant Life Church who love them, Lord, and who are with them, Father, and that believe them, oh God, and will love them, God, regardless of what they do or what they don't do, God. Lord, let your hand and your anointing be upon their parents, oh God. Lord, let their parents be Good, godly parents, Lord, and love and guide these children, oh God. Come on, let's just keep praying now. I'm going to put this down and let you guys keep praying.